when we talk about health policy, it's certainly been at the front of the national conversation for months, years. Um, as we've listened to both of our recent presidential candidates propose solutions, and then we watched Congress struggle unsuccessfully to pass legislation to reform the national health system. Now, we have Governors Kasich and Hickenlooper prepared to release what they're calling a bipartisan recommendation for health reform, taking lessons, as they say, from state-driven improvements to health care. So certainly, states are on the front lines of health care delivery solutions, but their experience is very widely, depending on their demographics and their political alignment. So our second panel is here to help us sort through the changing role of states in health policy. Dr. Donald Moulds will serve as our moderator. Dr. Moulds is currently the Executive Vice President for Programs at the Commonwealth Fund. But prior to joining the fund, he was Acting Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, where he served as a Principal Policy Advisor to Secretary Kathleen Sebelius. He's also served as the Vice President for the California Medical Association's Center for Meg Medical and Regulatory Policy, where he oversaw the development of association's health policy initiatives. He served on numerous boards and commissions associated with health and healthcare issues. He has a BA degree from Bates College and a master's and PhD degrees in philosophy from the University of Illinois. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Moulds and our second panel. The topic of this panel is the changing roles of uh, states in healthcare policy. Uh, and it shouldn't come as a surprise that going to talk a good amount about the Affordable Care Act this morning uh, and probably uh, about this debate that's been consuming Washington uh, over the last seven months about whether uh, to repeal the Affordable Care Act and if so, what to replace it with. Um, the Affordable Care Act is uh, frequently characterized as a very centralized approach to health care. Critics argue that it violates the balance of power between states and the federal government. Um, uh, by having taken power away from states and trusting the federal government with roles that have historically been played by, uh, by states when it comes to health care. Um, this is particularly true, or the criticism is, is particularly acute, um, when people start talking about the role of uh, the federal government in regulating health insurance. Um, some of the characterization is fair. Under the Affordable Care Act, the federal government has taken a much more central role in the regulation of health insurance. Essentially, it's created ground rules for what health insurance policies have to cover. Um, uh, it eliminated uh, health uh, uh, insurance underwriting. Uh, it created um, uh, mandates to purchase insurance. And through the Affordable Care Act, uh, there was about a billion dollar investment at the federal level in identifying new models that potentially change the way we pay for health care and significant investments also in, um, uh, in public health and prevention. Um, but the ACA also left many of the most critical decisions to states. Um, states get to choose whether to run their own insurance marketplaces, um, uh, courtesy of the Supreme Court. States get, states get to decide whether or not to expand Medicaid. Uh, and insurance regulation uh, arguably operates much more as a floor um, uh, than a series of prescriptions for states. So there are certainly provisions that are now in place at the federal level that didn't exist before, um, but states uh, can go beyond them and in a lot of instances have uh, a fair amount of latitude. Uh, even the innovation um, that was funded uh, through the Affordable Care Act, the billion dollar investment that I mentioned in the Centers for uh, Medicare and Medicaid Innovation at CMS, uh, um, are, are, are structured to identify local solutions and, um, uh, and to invest in them uh, and to uh, scale them, so to make them available for other places in the country. As a practical matter, we've seen the ACA play out very, very differently when you move from one state to another. So at the Commonwealth Fund, we do a lot of surveys. Um, we survey states. Um, uh, and ask all sorts of questions. And we oversample, as it turns out, in California uh, and a number of, of other large states, some of which have expanded and some of which have not. So um, let me give you an example uh, of the profound difference that you see when you move from one state to the other. So in California now, the, uh, the uninsurance rate is hovering a little bit above 7%. That's a drop from close to 18%. Um, 
uh, in Texas, when you move to Texas, um, uh, it's uh, at close to 17% right now. So millions more people without insurance. Um, when you look at the population that a lot of people look at, the 19 to 64, so, so not looking at kids and not looking at people who are largely um, uh, covered under Medicare, that number goes well above 20%. So huge differences in coverage, huge differences in access to care, uh, and we're starting to see some of that play out in actual differences in health. Um, uh, so, um, so you have very different experiences depending on the decisions that are being made in this country right now at the state level. Um, so to be clear, much of the repeal and replace debate that's been consuming Washington is about money. Um, there was, um, so the, the, both the House and the Senate bills proposed taking close to a trillion dollars out of health care. Uh, and returning it, um, some of it to industry, a lot of it to high wage earners um, uh, who face new taxes um, that were part of the Affordable Care Act. But there's also a real conversation, a much more philosophical conversation going on about the role of states um, uh, in healthcare and what that should look like uh, going forward. And whether or not we see another repeal and replace bill of the magnitude that we saw um, in, in both houses over the, the last few months. Um, this conversation about federalism is almost certainly going to consume a lot of the oxygen in healthcare for at least the next three and a half years. Um, so we have a really exciting panel um, uh, with us uh, here today. Um, uh, and it's also a, a really nice treat to be in California, my home state, um, uh, where, um, where the state has really leaned into the Affordable Care Act. So we're going to have an opportunity to hear about what that looks like and some of the decisions that have been made and that are being contemplated here. Um, I, I'm going to ask them a little bit about, um, about the conversation in Washington, where they think it's going to be going, um, and about um, how they're preparing for it. To my right um, is uh, Secretary of um, Health and Human Services in California, Diana Dooley. Diana was appointed in 2010 uh, by Governor Jerry Brown, um, but has the distinction of being a two-term uh, Brown staffer. Uh, we're all very lucky um, uh, that that played out the way it did. Um, uh, she was first his uh, legislative director um, when he was governor uh, back in the 70s and 80s. Um, uh, she, prior to um, uh, her experience at, at California uh, Health and Human Services, uh, she was running the Children's Hospital Association, uh, hails from Hanford, and, um, and very exciting to have her with us. Uh, to my, to my la immediate left is Peter Lee. Uh, Peter is the first and only executive director of Covered in California, which is the, the insurance marketplace here in the state of California. Uh, Peter was a colleague of mine in Washington. He was uh, deputy director of the uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation uh, and also ran delivery system reform for the Office of Health Reform. He also, just as an aside, uh, drove one of two uh, convertibles that was parked in the um, in the basement at HHS and frequented a uh, chicken joint right down the street from my house. <laughs> um, Ken Kaiser, um, uh, right next to Peter, is um, uh, is director of the Institute for Population Health Improvement at UC Davis. Um, uh, and a distinguished professor in both the UC Davis School of Medicine and the Betty Irene Moore uh, uh, School of Nursing. Uh, he, he served in a number of roles, both in the, in the public and private sectors. Uh, he was president and CEO in, um, uh, of uh, MedSphere Systems Corporation, uh, nation's leading commercial provider of open source healthcare information technology, and the founding president of the National Quality Forum. Um, he also uh, uh, had stints at the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, and, um, and, uh, and was, I believe, the Director of Health uh, uh, Healthcare Services in California. Uh, and then uh, Niraj Sood, uh, who is a prof professor and vice dean 
for research at the UC, um, Sol, USC Seoul Price School of Public Policy and also director of research at the Leonard Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics. Um, his work focuses on the economics of innovation, HIV AIDS, healthcare financing, and global health. Uh, so I thought we would start with you, Diana, if that's okay. Um, uh, and um, I'm gonna ask you a question about California's role in all of this stuff we've just been talking about. So, um, so you work for a Democratic governor, um, and um, but when the Affordable Care Act became law in 2010, Arnold Schwarzenegger was governor, um, uh, and it was under his tenure that California decided to create its own insurance marketplace. So you've had um, Jer uh, Governor Brown uh, made the decision to expand uh, Medicaid. But you've had two governors now, uh, one a Republican, one a Democrat, who have really leaned into the Affordable Care Act. Um, uh, can you uh, talk a little bit about how the Affordable Care Act has shaped um, health care in, in, in California, and um, uh, both for good or for bad, um, and, uh, and where you see it going forward? Thanks, Don, and I'm really delighted uh, to be here today. Um, and I, I do want to talk about the gains that we've made, but I also want to talk in the spirit of this group and the important roles that uh, everyone in the room plays in the process of government. I want to talk a little bit about the process as well, why we're where we are. We often are asked in California uh, why we are um, has have been as successful, uh, and uh, I certainly have no mission accomplished ban on the aircraft carrier here. Uh, we have a long way to go, and there are plenty of problems that uh, still need to be addressed. Um, but I think our, um, the progress that we've made uh, to a goal of universal coverage comes not in small part from the very point, Don, that you point out at the beginning, that we haven't um, face the partisan rancor uh, that has gripped uh, the rest of the country uh, around the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and indeed, California has at least a 25-year history of trying to reform a very irrational system. I mean, the, the American health care uh, has lots of problems that uh, really, after World War II, when countries began to address universal coverage uh, or the needs of its people to have coverage, California. I mean, America, the, this country, uh, went a different direction with a private sector role through individual insurance. And with wage and price controls in World War II, they let employers provide health care insurance uh, instead of wages to get around wage and price controls. And we went down a road of third-party payers that was added to in 1965 with Medicare and Medicaid, uh, where you had a third-party payer providing for health uh, for the very poor and uh, the elderly. Um, and ever since then, we've been trying to catch up toward a goal of universal coverage. When I worked for Governor Brown in the 70s, Medicare and Medicaid were only nine years old in 1975, and we were already in second-generation cost containment. Um, we have tried many times to control costs uh, with some success at, at different times with different devices. Uh, we've tried uh, individual mandates that went to voters 15 years ago. Uh, and indeed, in, in 2007 and 8, under a Republican governor, uh, we came very close to adopting what was then Romney Care. You know, before it was Obamacare, it was Romney Care and Schwarzenegger Care. Uh, this was the Republican private sector market based approach to universal coverage. You know, Democrats wanted single payer, and as we know, many Democrats still do want single payer. Um, but that's not what we've got. We've got a market-based approach, and it's necessarily over this 70-year history um, become a Rube Goldberg machine that Rube Goldberg wouldn't have built. Uh, it's not rational. Uh, there are lots of problems with it. And so the history in California led to the recognition when we tried very hard and came very close less than 10 years ago uh, to do it on our own that it required a federal solution. So. California, in a bipartisan way, was very supportive of the ACA approach when they finally got to what became uh, the ACA. 
We did take that baton uh, from a Republican governor. Regrettably, we took another baton in 2011, which was a $27 billion deficit. And so the governor made very clear that we had to balance the budget before we could start, you know, take this shiny new penny of additional coverage. So uh, while we maintained the commitment that the Schwarzenegger administration had made, uh, both to an individual market with our own exchange and to the Medicaid expansion, which, which Schwarzenegger had made a commitment to by advancing through an 1115 waiver process with the federal government an agreement to bring uninsured in the counties in earlier than 2014. Uh, there was a big commitment that was already made in California. But I think our approach cautiously, given the conditional nature to our investment, uh, in many ways allowed us um, to be circumspect and to engage a very broad group of stakeholders. Uh, in addition to being secretary of Health and Human Services, which governs the Medi-Cal program, which is Medicaid in California, there are 13 other departments within this agency. Uh, and as secretary, I am uh, a, desig a, a statutorily designated member of the uh, exchange board. So I also chair Covered California. Uh, and it was our great good fortune to get Peter Lee. And I could talk a little bit about uh, the individual market, but I'm going to leave that to him. My role has been to integrate not only between our Medi-Cal program and our private insurance market and the issues related to that, but the social services, social determinants of health, our aging programs, our institutional programs, developmentally disabled, behavioral health, all of that integration that we are promoting and working to achieve came as a result of the statutory uh, authority granted in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, almost everyone thinks of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare uh, as coverage expansion, and surely coverage expansion is a very important part of it. But there is a great deal more to that act that begins to address or give tools to the states to begin to address the underlying um, uh, irrationality of the delivery system. And so um, we have taken an approach of uh, very um, strong and aggressive stakeholder engagement uh, through our exchange processes. Um, in addition to providing subsidies that the Act did, it also provided in the first two or three years a great deal of startup funding for community outreach. We used all of it uh, to develop a network of community trusted uh, um, people in each community, uh, and, and Peter can talk more about the thousands of navigators and enrollment assisters and uh, insurance agents uh, that are working with us to advance this goal of universal coverage. We've worked with the plans. Uh, you know, one of the things that that I believe will need to continue to evolve uh, is this um, sense that the health insurance plans are the enemy. Uh, believe me, I'm not an apologist, but they are a part of a delivery system uh, that includes providers, the payers, the government, the patients. Uh, and all of this has um, become so complicated. When we see the costs, we point the finger at the plans because that's where we see the premiums. But one of the things the Affordable Care Act did was create a, a, a medical loss ratio that requires that 80 or 85 percent, depending on the kind of plan, uh, of the spend goes to medical loss. So all of this has brought into greater focus the driving forces, which are the provider costs, the medical costs, the um, uh, pharmacy costs, all of that is built into the premium in a much more transparent way than was ever known before. And I think over time, we need to think of the plans more as the agent of the patient and the, and the payer. Um, but then we've got to address how much everything else costs. And we tend to like our doctors and like our hospitals uh, and like the devices and like the tests that we get and like all of the parts of the system that we're not seeing, that we don't think we're paying for. What we pay for is our premium. And when our premium goes up for our, for our employer and we don't get a wage increase, we're mad at the premiums. Um, but I think that we will understand, and we already do understand, uh, 
uh, as um, our president recently famously said, who knew this was complicated. Um, and, and I think that we have to reconcile the rhetoric with the reality. For seven years, the Republicans in Congress have been able to say, replace, replace it. But a lot of what people are um, concerned about have been the underlying problems that the ACA was designed to address. And um, I think what we've seen in this last year with the conversation, uh, part of what allowed the, um, the conversation to have resonance that uh, Obamacare was failing was because there were a lot of critics of it, but many of those critics were not criticizing the law. They wanted more of it, not less. So the hospitals and the doctors and the health plans and the patients uh, they they complained about an annual cap of six thousand dollars being too low, but there wasn't even a cap before the ACA. Uh, so when it when it was threatened with repeal, you saw an um, uh, just a almost universal uh, coming together of a recognition that they can't get rid of it. Uh, and most of the solutions that are proposed are to have more of it, to get rid of the family glitch or the five four hundred percent cliff or I could go on to the details but the important thing is there is a recognition uh, in a way that that many of us only have dreamed about for more than 30 years that universal coverage is a right uh, it is a, a recognition that everyone should have some level of coverage what is the level of care that we get I think the jury's out and we've still got to talk about what are the essential benefits and what are the floors but I think the fundamental question that everyone should have some health care um, is largely uh, been addressed and I believe that we are on a path um, to working toward that goal in a way that we never did before. So, so that's terrific. You, you just described a lot of really fundamental changes um, that have taken place in California. We were in an environment uh, up until a few weeks ago where it was uh, literally a coin flip, maybe worse than a coin flip about whether or not a lot of this was going to go away. Can you talk about, um, about, you talked about, about funding and some of the challenges of moving forward um, early in the Brown administration when you were facing these huge debts, um, uh, this huge debt uh, in California. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the, the decrease in the funding on the Medicaid side would have meant and how you were engaged in planning here in California for, for that? Well, let me just add to to what I said about the repeal effort. Um, there's no example anywhere in our American history of taking away the kind of benefit that the Affordable Care Act or, uh, uh, represents. And so I think this really has been a local government, uh, local community, not local government, but a local community response. All of those Republican members began to hear from the people who were benefited by this in their districts. There was very little role for California to play in the conversation that's gone on over the last uh, six months. Peter has played a dramatic role in providing technical information about the details, uh, and, but the actual politics of the last six months, we have been pretty sidelined. Everybody knows where we are and what we think, and nobody really asks uh, in Washington. Uh, but they've heard from the 33 states that have expanded Medicaid. They've heard from the coalition of Republican governors that understand the benefit uh, to their people. And so take Taking away a benefit like that is unprecedented, and I think it can't happen. But the amount of money that's spent is where the the rubber meets the road. You always have to follow the money. Uh, and the the risk to reducing the funding that comes uh, to the states uh, also makes it very hard to do. Uh, in California, uh, roughly it would have been about a $20 billion loss uh, by 2025. Um, our share just of the Medicaid expansion in 2020 uh, at the 14, 2014 levels is a $2 billion additional general fund. So if everything stays just as it is, we are spending more on the 4 million additional Medicaid members that are a result of the ACA. So even though they're paying 90% of the cost, our 10% is no small budget item. So it was a it was an uh, important decision to make to go forward. Um, 
um, it's hard to turn that kind of money away. But you take in the first year alone, as I said, in 2014, $20 billion came into California from the federal government. Um, the effect on our economy is extraordinary. You could throw $20 billion $1 bills up in the air, and you would have an impact positively on the economy. So it isn't just the patients who would lose care. It's all of the providers and all of the um, network of uh, the medical industrial complex uh, that is deeply invested in this uh, uh, proposal. Can you walk our audience through some of the major changes that were part of the, uh, the repeal and replace bills in the House and the Senate? Talk a little bit about, about your planning uh, for them, what they would have meant for you, and, and some of the ways in which you were planning for them. Great. Happy to. And it's, it's great to be here. And thanks for reminding me about our time in Washington. Uh, I, I will note, some people here might watch Game of Thrones. I, I read it when I was working with the Obama administration. And it, <laughs> it felt ever so true. Good people die and things like that happen. But um, I didn't realize that, uh, I didn't realize what it meant to be close to the throne until someone said, oh, you've got a parking place. Wow. <laughs> so that, that's, that's the equivalent of being close to the throne, I realized there. But anyway, back to, uh, first, I want to underscore one of the things that um, both Don and Diana spoke to is what we've done in California. Um, reducing the rate of uninsured to about 7%, half of that 7% are undocumented, which means we reduce the rate of what I might call the eligible uninsured to about 3.5%. Um, that is phenomenal. And I totally agree with Diana. No time for a you know, mission accomplished. But California is approaching universal coverage rates. If you go to European countries, they have 3%, I'm sure. We still need a safety net, but we have developed a system that is very robust with Medi-Cal, with Covered California for the exchange. Um, the other thing that I'd note is um, how we've done this in California. Well, there's a lot of elements we might get into later, but we in California have on the individual market both on and off exchange, that one of the healthiest risk mix of the nation. It's working for health plans, but most importantly, it's working for consumers. And we can talk about what that is, but that's part of the context of what we have here. Uh, I really need to underscore what Diana noted, which is in the last uh, five years ago, uh, with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, it was based on something that was being followed. Is there a government role for making sure everyone has health insurance? Um, I've been struck by the fact that the House of Representatives repeal and replace effort, you know, changed dramatically the structure. Took a lot of money out from Medicaid programs and said, we will fund subsidies, but they won't be income-based, they'll be age-based, and we won't look at geographical variation. Migration to the Senate repeal and replace bills. The Senate repeal bills all of a sudden said, you know, we're going to go with the Affordable Care Act structure. Subsidies based on income, adjusted based on where you live, which means adjusted for cost of health care. Uh, there will be Medicaid, uh, though, cutting back the money. But in essence, and there will absolutely be guaranteed issue. So it was a, it was a floor issue to say now that those that said repeal and replace, that you can no longer be turned away from insurance because of your health status. And there will be financial help to get you out of health care. So that is a mammoth transformation that in the seven years or so that the, there's a national consensus now, not around something labeled Obamacare. There's no consensus around a label, but around guaranteed issue uh, and financial support that everyone should have health care. And so that's been a, a migration that has been phenomenal. And as you know, even the Senate bill went down. Um, the, the things that I note on planning uh, and where we are, having said that there is um, now uh, philosophical agreement there needs to be, quote unquote, towards universal coverage, federal support, health plans can't turn people away. Um, there's still not federal support for the current structure of the Affordable Care Act. And so, you know, the Senate will be, and the House be reconvening in a matter of a week. Um, one of the issues that's hugely in play is not a matter of the law, but a matter of what uh, Congress and the administration do to fund part of the law, which is cost sharing reduction subsidies. Now, I know this is sort of a wonky crowd, but one of the core elements of the Affordable Care Act on the individual market side 
is first, people that are eligible based on income and where they live get financial help to buy health insurance. They pick the plan, they get financial help. The lower income of them also get help when they show up at the doctor's office. So instead of having a $40 copay, it might be a $5 copay. Now that makes a big difference because if you make $20,000 a year, you will skip going to the doctor's office if it's going to cost you 40 bucks instead of five. That's a core element. Well, it's now being fought over whether or not that's going to be funded directly to the health plans or not. Um, Congress can make it clear this September that yes, let's keep funding it. Right now, it is phenomenally uncertain because the Trump administration has said, we are deciding month by month whether or not we continue writing checks to health plans to fund this integral element of the Affordable Care Act. So in the midst of there being national policy discussions that really are saying guaranteed issue is now um, sort of table stakes, federal support is table stakes, there's still uh, a lot of uncertainty that states are having to deal with. That's super. And just as a so, just to give folks a, a sense of the of the significance of 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 the ambiguity um, and and potentially on the on the cost sharing reduction payments going away, what does that represent? Just as a as an increase in the percent of of, of uh, insurance in California. Well, just it, California is a big state. I know many of you are from different states, uh, but I'd also remind you that in many ways. We're big, but many we're like a lot of other states. Central Valley is sort of like Idaho. You know, northern counties are sort of like Montana. Uh, LA is like LA, but then so <laughs> it's, 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 it's different places. But um, but so we are big. Uh, the overall individual market is about seven billion dollars, one billion in uh, cost sharing reduction subsidies. So health plans, if that money were pulled out from under them, would lose a billion dollars. Uh, we at Cover California negotiate very actively with the health plans. That's one of the differences in our model. As Don noted, states could implement the Affordable Care Act quite differently. In our state, we took a quite activist role. Um, plans told us they would not play in 2018 with the amount of federal uncertainty. Um, we created a workaround that said, well, if we don't have clarity that the federal government will continue to fund the cost sharing reduction subsidies, we will put a surcharge on the silver plan that is subsidized, and that surcharge on average is going to be about 13%. But it ranges from 8 to 25%. But that surcharge will end up being paid for by the federal government through an increase in the tax credit. And it's a more complex issue, but it's a workaround where we have gotten out ahead of these issues to say, let's not give consumers the uncertainty of having health plans participate by giving health plans that certainty. So this next year we have 11 health plans participating throughout California. These are the same 11 plans that were with us in January 2014. And that stability is because it's a market that's working for the plans. John, can I jump in there just for a second because I, I th th thought I meant to say this and I didn't before. When I talk about how it's worked in California uh, and I talk to other states and what can they do, uh, in addition to it being bipartisan and we had a history and we had an understanding and we had an engaged provider and a payer community, uh, the most important thing is we wanted to make it work. The will to make it work is essential and that's not what, that's what's not transportable. That's exportable. I mean, we can't make that work in another state or another area and that's where it has to be organic. That's where I think this repeal conversation that has, um, um, informed so many people has started conversations that never existed before the threat to their um, of to their advantage. So wanting to make it work uh, and having creative people like Peter, this uh, way that we have found to put this cost into the federal uh, payment system uh, is now being exported. Kaiser Family picked up Peter's analysis and they reported on it. Uh, even the CBO score, when they came out, they talked about this way to include the cost in the silver plan. It's very wonky and detailed, um, but we want to make it work and we found a way. Every time we have found a roadblock over the last six years, uh, we have scaled those high mountains and uh, gotten over them. And so I, I think that 
shape what you and that's where um, the local community and and that is exportable is creating um, the recognition that there is a problem first as some of the earlier speakers today talked about how do you define the problem it, you have to talk about it before you can solve it uh, so you are running arguably the um, the most high functioning marketplace in the country here in California can you talk uh, just at a high level about some of the things that that you're doing and and some of what distinguishes California from some of the other marketplaces I mean one I'd echo Diana not just because she's my boss but she's also right it's it, it, um, you know I spent a lot of time traveling across California uh, as Diana noted, we have 14,000 licensed insurance agents across California who are selling uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, they have storefronts labeled Covered California, and you know I, I can guarantee you a whole bunch of them voted for Donald Trump. And that's a separate issue. You can say whether that's good or bad, but they're out there on, on main streets across California. Um, we, uh, and I think one of the things I give uh, a lot of credit to uh, Governor Schwarzenegger and the Democratic legislature um, Cover California is independent. It's part of the state, but we have a five-member independent board. We are not part of the state budget because we have to fund ourselves. We operate like a business. Now, in operating like a business, that means we make investments in marketing and outreach without having to go to the legislature and say, can you give us $40 million instead of funding this great program for kids with diabetes or high-speed rail? I do not want to appear, with all due respect, before the legislature and make that pitch. I don't need to. I go to our board and say, we are proposing a $330 million budget of which 111 million is gonna be for marketing and outreach. And here's the three to one ROI on how that will lower premiums across the market. And the board says, hot damn. Uh, well, they say, we approve, but they, they meant hot damn. They, they said, uh, but it's a, it's, I mean, that's an example of really of having both the independent structure and uh, the accountability of being a running like a business that has been key to our success. The, the other things that I'd note is that, um, again, being activist, uh, and one of the things that I'd encourage you to look at is our benefit designs. Now, uh, Don noted the Affordable Care Act set broad national guardrails. There are nationally... Uh, essential health benefits, 10 essential health benefits nationally. Everywhere you go in the country, you will find a silver plan. That silver plan, whether you're in California, Idaho, Colorado, or Texas, is 70% actuarial value, which means 70% of what is being paid for comes out of the insurance premium, and 30% the individual insured pays for. Okay, And all the 10 essential benefits are covered. But beyond that, it can be structured differently. Well, in California, the benefit designs are common across every one of our carriers. And at that silver tier, which is where 70% of the people sign up, zero outpatient care is subject to a deductible. Now, I want to repeat that. You, you hear a lot of news stories about with the Affordable Care Act, people don't get access to care because of high deductibles. Total hooey. If you say, in California, we want our plans to compete based on the cost of the care, the doctors in the network, not on benefit design obscurante. Consumers like it, the health plans like it, it's working, but right now nationally, that's not the case. If you go to Colorado, you've got some of those silver plans that will have a $2,500 deductible that you need to meet before the insurance kicks in and covers your primary care visit. With all due respect, that's a crappy benefit design. That's a benefit design framed in the pre-Affordable Care Act days when benefit designs were around risk selection, not around helping people get the right care at the right time. So that's another example of, of ingredients that have made things work in California. Peter, it's been a very long time since I've heard hooey, so thank you for that. My pleasure. <laughs> um, I, I want to turn. Um, I want to turn to some of the other parts of the Affordable Care Act, um, uh, and and some of the larger changes that have taken place in healthcare in the last decade that aren't part of the Affordable Care Act. So a couple of things. One is the, um, and I'm taking advantage of the fact that we have it. Um, uh, and, and a health information technology expert uh, here on the panel. Um, but uh, we made this uh, historic, I believe, $30 billion investment in uh, electronic medical records um, 
in the U.S. Uh, through the recovery funds um, that have resulted in huge take-up increases um, in the use of electronic medical records. Uh, and we've been engaged in this, uh, uh, on this path towards changing the way that we pay for care in the United States. So moving away from the, the traditional fee-for-service model um, where you pay on a service basis uh, and paying for value and, and outcomes instead. Uh, Ken, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about those two efforts. I'm happy to hear about your involvement uh, in them. Uh, and then I, I'm going to ask you to prognosticate a little bit and talk about where they might uh, be headed under uh, the Trump administration. Before going there, uh, I, I have to confess that, that this uh, morning uh, is a little deja vu uh, in the sense that uh, having uh, been around the California health scene for going on close to 40 years now, uh, there's a lot of issues, uh, and I, I served as uh, director of the former uh, Department of Health Services through most of the 1980s uh, up until the summer of, of 91. And on listening to the former panel and some of the things uh, that have been said on this one already, uh, it, it brings back lots of, of memories uh, and, and lots of uh, issues. And, and while I know that most of the uh, conversation is intended to focus on the Affordable Care Act, we probably would be remiss if we didn't note that there's a lot of other uh, important health issues that California is dealing with. Indeed, Diane and I had a, a brief conversation about this the other day and, and to use a uh, a military metaphor, uh, it's a target-rich environment uh, when we look at uh, health issues. And, and just a, a couple that uh, come to mind, uh, lead uh, in water. Uh, indeed, when I was a health director, we implemented this new and novel, uh, some one of the uh, uh, first programs in the country to uh, look at, uh, assess lead uh, poisoning uh, or lead toxicity uh, and here we find now, uh, many years later, that we have a, uh, a substantial lead problem, and in many of our schools and other public systems have lead contamination that is as bad or worse than uh, is found in, in Flint, Michigan. Uh, and this is going to be an enormous issue that we have to deal with uh, going forward. Uh, another uh, air pollution. Uh, again, I re remember dealing a lot with air pollution issues in the, in the 80s, and notwithstanding uh, the substantial progress that California has made and, and many of the novel things that California has done in this regard, when the American Lung Association released its annual report of the most air polluted cities uh, in the country uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we find that again, uh, California, depending on whether you want to look at ozone or, or uh, particulates, has six or seven of the top ten most polluted uh, cities in the country from an air perspective, so lots of work to be done there. Uh, on the, the cap and trade uh, issue and, and talking about some of the potential reformulation of products, I'm reminded of Prop 65 uh, and when it was implemented and resulted in, uh, at last count, I heard more than 10% of all the uh, consumer products in the country were reformulated uh, as a result of uh, Prop 65 uh, being implemented here in California. Uh, and the last uh, thing I would mention on this list, which could go on uh, quite a number of other things, was the, uh, the tobacco control program and the uh, new uh, tobacco tax that was implemented on cigarettes in the late 1980s, uh, a, a program that has been uh, uh, replicated uh, in many other states and has shown, uh, California really has shown dramatic uh, different uh, improvements in, in uh, health as a result of uh, the decreased smoking, which can be tied back to uh, that tobacco tax. Uh, today that we have kind of two variants on that issue that we're dealing with uh, also, uh, the smokeless tobacco and how those uh, products are, are going to be uh, regulated. And then second is the uh, issues related to cannabis uh, and marijuana. And certainly California is in the forefront of, of dealing with uh, some of those issues. Indeed, we uh, learn just within the last few weeks about the uh, environmental pollution and the uh, uh, severe uh, environmental pollution from the result of illegal uh, marijuana growing uh, in many of the, the counties here in California. It's, it's a relatively uh, unique problem to uh, California. Uh, but let me get back to uh, the question that, that you asked on, um, and, and again, a, a little bit of a uh, uh, 
deja vu uh, uh, with regard to value-based payment and, and uh, controlling health care costs under the Affordable Care Act. The, uh, uh, the deja vu part, uh, I remember uh, during my tenure uh, that just about um, every meeting I had with the governor uh, and because of the uh, large number of issues that we had that were uh, in the, the public light, uh, that was fairly frequent. Um, he began every conversation with pretty much the same line, regardless of what we were meeting on, and it was, you know, Kaiser, when are you going to get the Medi-Cal costs under control? Uh, and that was, uh, we're about, <laughs> we're about five times uh, larger expenditure uh, today than, than we were then. Uh, so uh, that's going to continue to be uh, an issue, and um, the uh, electronic, uh, well, let me just finish that, that thought. It, it's not entirely clear where that uh, uh, is going to go. I, I think it would probably not shock anyone to hear that this administration has uh, been somewhat unclear about where it intends to go with regard to health care uh, reform uh, and has not perhaps laid out clear markers as to where it intends to go uh, with regard to controlling uh, health care costs, which uh, has to be done. Um, and so it's unclear other than the fact that there appears to be uh, going to be some rollback of some of the uh, efforts in value-based payment uh, and some uh, perhaps rollback on, on uh, other regulatory things that might fall under that broad umbrella. But where that's going to go is, is less clear uh, however, the essentiality of addressing and dealing with, with rising uh, and disproportionately rising uh, health care costs is something that, that simply cannot be uh, escaped, and, and it's just a little unclear. And I think here, uh, perhaps California has uh, the opportunity to demonstrate uh, some leadership, uh, although uh, it is certainly not without uh, some controversy. Uh, the uh, other issue you asked about electronic health records, uh, clearly there's been uh, dramatic uh, uptake in the use of electronic health records and other advanced information and, and communication technologies uh, over the last uh, 15 years. Uh, I'm again reminded of a, uh, of a conversation I have with Secretary Tommy Thompson uh, back in uh, late August uh, in 2002, uh, exactly 15 uh, years ago, almost to the day, um, when I went, and, and at that time I was uh, head of the National Quality Forum and had previously, during my uh, tenure as head of the VA, had implemented a uh, system-wide electronic uh, health record there, which was uh, clearly uh, state-of-the-art uh, and something that had not been done elsewhere, but it had demonstrated its advantages. I, I went to see uh, Secretary Thompson to lobby him uh, to take this on as a, an issue uh, that uh, the Bush administration would be pushing. And after uh, he uh, politely uh, listened to me for about 20 or 25 minutes uh, extolling all the reasons why he should take this on, uh, he looked at me and, and uh, I, I can't tell you exactly what he said uh, in, in here, but he said, that is the dumbest expletive idea that I've ever heard. Uh, you know, giving doctors a bunch of computers isn't going to, uh, no one's going to remember me uh, for that. Uh, now, to his credit, uh, with some continued um, conversation over a period of several weeks, he did uh, uh, embrace the idea, saw the value, uh, and a lot of things moved forward from there. And there's no question that uh, the uh, use uh, and proliferation and use of electronic records has been advantageous, uh, although it's come with, not surprisingly, some unintended uh, side effects uh, and current concerns about physician burnout uh, related to uh, use of electronic health records, uh, safety issues uh, related to EHRs. Uh, I mean, it, it really should not be surprising uh, that there would be unintended consequences because with every uh, complex change, uh, there's going to be unintended consequences, and we're now at a point where we're seeing some of those, and certainly over the uh, next few years, we're going to have to uh, focus more on how to achieve uh, better interoperability 
between uh, EHRs. Uh, clearly work has been done and is ongoing in that regard, but there's a lot more that, that needs to be done there. We're going to have to focus on the safety uh, issues that have been brought forward about EHRs, as well as how to make them more user-friendly uh, and uh, make it easier to incorporate them into the uh, care processes. Let me stop there, Don. That's helpful. Um, and Naraj, you're a, you're a health economist, so I feel compelled to ask you about cost control also. Um, where do you see the cost control efforts going? Um, uh, how do you think uh, federal um, decision making is going to affect states? And, and I'll also add just um, because I know that you've been on the National Academies panel that's taking a hard look at the prescription drug cost issue. Um, whether you have thoughts about uh, that conversation, whether it's likely to um, uh, to um, move forward, as the president has indicated uh, at the federal level, or not, and and whether you see the possibility of that conversation being taken up in a meaningful way uh, and seeing meaningful reform at the state level. Thank you, Don. So uh, I know I'm probably the only health economist in the room. So I'm going to start by uh, teaching you some health economics. And that's going to guide uh, the policy solutions I think are important for controlling healthcare costs. So I think one thing most economists know, and maybe a lot of people in the room know, is that healthcare spending is highly concentrated. So the top 1% of spenders account for 20% of spending. So that is, so basically what this means in terms of a policy solution is, if you can figure out who those 1% are, and if you can control their costs, you can make a huge difference in healthcare costs. But the bottom 50% account for you know, 10% or less of spending, so 3% of spending. So I think that, and that has implications for covered California or healthcare exchanges also. That if a health insurance plan is stuck with a top 1%er, you are in big trouble. That you know, that's why Peter spends a lot of time marketing because to offset that one person, you need to enroll at least 15 to 20 healthy people to balance out your premiums. So I think that's one uh, big lesson from health economics. The second big lesson is that incentives matter. Incentives matter for both consumers as well as doctors and providers. So a lot of people in the public have this view that my doctor is going to do the right thing, they care about my health and nothing else, or my hospital is going to do the right thing, they care about my health and nothing else. And there is decades of research to show that that's not true. That you know, we are all humans, we all like fancy cars, and we all like to live in big houses and so on. And so we all respond to financial incentives. And I think that's where payment reform comes in. Or there are kind of two ways of addressing the incentive part you can change incentives for consumers, so through the high deductible health plans and such, where basically consumers have more skin in the game to control costs, or you can change incentives for providers, move away from cost-based reimbursement and give them money or give them a bonus if they reduce overall costs. So if your doctor does a good job treating you and as a result you don't end up in the hospital, give a bonus to the doctor for, for doing that extra effort. And what a lot of research, including a lot of my own research shows, is that putting the right incentives on the provider side is probably a better approach than putting cost sharing on the consumer side. So for example, a lot of my research on high deductible plans shows is that when consumers have more skin in the game, they do respond to that. So they do reduce their healthcare costs by about you know, 7 to 15%, depending on the study you look at. But when we see, does that make people smarter? We don't find any evidence of that. So we don't find any evidence that people price shop for care. We find evidence that people just stop taking their drugs rather than moving to a generic. We find evidence that they don't make any disproportionate reductions in low value care. So they're basically reducing all care. They cannot tell what's a low value care or what's high value care. In fact, I had an interesting anecdote where I was talking to another colleague about you know, these choosing wisely measures and these doctors coming up with a bunch of measures saying these are all low value. And he said for a consumer, nothing is no value. You can say an MRI for a back pain is low value, but for a consumer, that's peace of mind or that's just something they want to have, especially if they have insurance. So which in some sense is the third lesson from health economics, which is that 
insurance or providing insurance is not going to solve the cost problem. So it's great that we have universal or near universal healthcare coverage in California, but that's not going to solve the cost problem. There was a big experiment done recently in Oregon where they were basically looking at there was a lottery held, and if you won the lottery, you got Medicaid. And if you lost the lottery, then you were on your own. And what they found was that people who had Medicaid, they ha went to the ER more often than people who didn't have Medicaid. So this common story that, oh, we're going to take the people out of the ER and we're going to reduce costs because we're going to take better care of people, that isn't borne out by you know, the gold standard studies in health economics. And what's borne out is what determines your health care or your health is not your health care, but your health-related behaviors. So this is where your social determinants of health come in, that you need to go in the communities and change those health-related behaviors if you want to improve health and improve and lower health care costs. So for example, if you look at the top 10 spenders or top 10% of spenders in the US who are persistently on the top 10, so they were top 10 in one year and then they were top 10 in the second year, how many of them had insurance? 98%. How many of them had poor health? Nearly 100%. So it's basically underlying healthcare costs is how, how healthy you are and not whether or not you have insurance. In fact, a lot of the evidence shows that having insurance might increase healthcare costs in the long run. And that's why your governor is, you know, after. <laughs> and I think in this current federal environment, controlling healthcare costs is even more important because you might not have the federal dollars to match uh, the state dollars. Uh, so I think I'll stop there and then maybe we can have a Could I jump in just for a second, Don? I hate to do this, except that that fundamental question in your first economics lesson uh, is has been missed by so many, including Speaker Ryan, when he said, the problem is we've got healthy people paying for sick people. That is the fundamental principle of insurance. And we have an insurance concept. You don't have an auto accident to use your auto insurance. You don't want your house to burn down to use your homeowner's insurance. But everyone's going to use their health insurance. So it's a hybrid from a market standpoint or an economic standpoint. It's partly insurance for catastrophic, but it's also a prepaid plan. It's something that you expect to use and you want to use. And so how do you regulate that and manage it with with a mixed understanding in the body politic of what it is, what the actual product is. Going back to Ryan's plan that you know the Republican solution for this is to create a high risk pool where you're gonna take these people out of the regular insurance pool. But basically what this fundamental economic principle says is that if you have that top one percent in your high risk pool, you better spend twenty percent of money on the high risk pool. Yeah. Yeah. And 20% of the $3 trillion is nowhere, you know, it's a huge That's number. That's why all the high-risk pools fail. Yeah. 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 So in some sense, there is, you know, you can argue that you can do what Peter does, which is a lot of marketing and getting the healthy people in, or you can have a high-risk pool. I think both economically make sense, but the high-risk pool has to be well-funded. Yeah. You cannot say, I'm going to spend $2 billion on the high-risk pool and solve the problem. Yes, Cal California learned that lesson over many years the hard way. <laughs> Peter? Yeah, I, used to have a line. I want to get to the questions and answers. Uh, well, I think it's so great we wrap up to turn to the audience talking about healthcare costs, because that's been the piece that has not been well addressed, and uh, Ken addressed it. The, you know, my tenure, as you know, at the of <coughs> Medicare and Medicaid Innovation was about addressing costs. Um, it's, at Cover California, we're doing a lot of things about healthcare costs. My one worry with an academic, no offense to it, it's that true. The Oregon is a, so to speak, gold standard, but there's so much we don't know that we need to be really careful about. So I, mean, I want to give you two examples that cover California. We have a, a range of contractual requirements to change payments, to require our health plans to uh, pay differently for care that is better coordinated and better integrated. And I want to know, some of this is belief-based and not really well evidence-based. Because there's not really good gold standards except for the current uh, crappy standard of generally uh, specialists are paid a lot of money and have huge incentives to do a lot of things and we don't have incentives to have primary care well paid for or done well. So we're making a not great evidence-based uh, decision to put our thumb on the scale. Another piece about it didn't surprise me at all
that in Oregon, uh, ER visits went up. Because that's where people that have been uninsured go for their care. They do not have a regular source of care. They get insurance. They go more to the ER. Covered California, we instituted a policy. I want to thank the board that as of 2017, every single one of our enrollees, including the 50% in PPOs, was provisionally assigned a primary care provider. Not as a gatekeeper, but they knew they had someone to go to that's not an ER. And so the issues of getting to changing cost structure in the delivery system is one that there's no single bullet. So just coverage is not going to be the solution. So I totally agree with that. But what are the right mix of changes on the payment side, changes on the consumer side? And those are the ones I think we all need to be turning to that I think California is turning to, both on the Medi-Cal front and at uh, Cover California. When I went with my son to the ER for an appendectomy, by the time he came out, when I received the bill, it was $19,000 from UC Davis Hospital. But of course, the insurance paid on $17,000. But if I didn't have the insurance, I would have been on the hook for at least half of that much. So if I knew any of the costs involved, as they were happening, I would have made the decision so much more different. Jason, what are you guys doing? I'm trying to I, I so love that question. Is you only run a stick for 17000 Your health plan should have said, here's four providers can do appendectomies, if, if, assuming it wasn't an emergency, and emergencies are much harder because it, in, the hospital, I mean, in the ER, it's not a good time to make a quality and value-based choice. But uh, I can bet you that there were just as good providers to do that appendectomy that would have cost you 4000 for your out-of-pocket. And so we require all of our plans to make tools available that are based on Given your benefit design and given your net networks that you've contracted with, what's the out-of-pocket exposure and total cost? Um, now, making the tools available is only the first part. Getting people to use them is the second. And that's a piece we're working with the plans on. Is, I, I think that you know, I am a big believer in changing incentives. But in the end, I think consumers with, and that's where the Ryan proposal, that it's all about high deductibles, then people have not just skin, but their entire arm in the game is an interesting <laughs> approach, but without the tools and information, it's meaningless. So that's an example. We're, every one of our 11 health plans has to have tools. So when you're going for an elective procedure, you can see what will it cost you with provider X versus provider Y, and what's the total cost. So I, I did a study where we looked at the effect of these tools on costs, and we found that there were big savings. So people saved on imaging services, and people saved on lab services, and so on. But Peter is absolutely right that only 3% of the population who, for whom this tool was available, it was a simple online tool, only 3% actually used the tool. So even though we're making these tools, a lot of consumers are not actually using these tools. But, but, but this is also where it requires some thumb on the scale. I, I particularly appreciated Chad Mays earlier talking about a free market is good, but there is antitrust. There is a place where you have to put your thumb on the scale. And we just did it with, and some of it is just transparency. Uh, we did it with cesarean sections in the Department of Public Health. We publicized the cesarean rate in hospitals, and the goal is 23%. A good hospital is less than that. We have hospitals in California that have a 65% cesarean rate. And when we published that, the newspapers in those communities went to those hospitals and said, what is your C-section rate? And they immediately signed up for this pilot and said, oh yeah, we're going to be a part of it and we're going to be moving toward the 23% goal. And, and we didn't regulate anything. We just exposed it. So some of it is information, um, but it's very hard in essentially an unrelated, uh, unregulated free market of healthcare. Everybody complains about about all the regulations, but it, it's pretty much um, people charging whatever they want, and we have a very hard time getting at it, except through the kind of market management that we're doing at Covered California. Yeah, if you're, if you're looking for a model where this has really worked, um, CalPERS um, did this in a joint replacement, and essentially what they did for members is they said, you can go here, and it will cost you zero dollars, or you can go over there, and it's going to cost you 9000 and here's the quality information. And, and go figure, it's more or less exactly the same or maybe a little bit better on the free option. And people are going to make the right choice when they're presented with that information, but there are a lot of steps that you have to take to get them. Is single-payer system the answer? And yes or no, but does it make any sense to do single-payer in one state, in a big state like California? 
so I think Diana gets to start. <laughs> <laughs> I, and you might expect I get the question quite a bit. Uh, and I think um, in general, uh, I don't have a position on, on the single payer proposal. I have my head down trying to make the Affordable Care Act. That's the law of the land and that's what we're doing. But there are, uh, and in, 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 for the same reasons that we had trouble trying to make it work in California alone, having a floor of commonality across the country as we do in the ACA makes a lot of sense, and single payer particularly, and I'll tell you why. There are three primary buckets of issues associated with moving to single payer, and they're all hard. They're not unresolvable, but they almost all require some kind of uniformity across the states. The first is the amount of federal spending on Medicare and Medicaid. The proposals, the California proposal presumes that you take all that federal money and you turn it into state dollars. So uh, you take all of the federal money from Medicare, which is a wholly federal program, plus the spending on Medicaid, and that comes to the state, plus the state keeps its current investment in Medicaid. So that's one bucket of money, and that's in the neighborhood of 40% of the total cost of care in California. Then you take all of the private spend, which are the premiums paid by employers and employees, and you turn that into a tax and you give that to the government as well. And that is, a, a, you know, another, I don't know what the percentages are, my economists could, could do that. Uh, and then you have, you replace the health plans with a government agency, so like a PUC for healthcare. So you have some government body that's gonna decide how much you pay all the doctors and hospitals and providers and what your minimum benefits are and whether you need that extra MRI and, you know, so all of those decisions, both on utilization and on payment, are made by a government agency. Now, we are really committed in this administration uh, to restoring trust in government, uh, and I particularly appreciate what Matt said, and I would say that about all my colleagues across the cabinet in this administration. The governor learned a lot from his experience as mayor. Uh, he is a big believer in what he calls subsidiarity, which is a Jesuit concept of making the decision as close to your personal, you know, everybody making decisions for themselves. Themselves. And the best decisions come, and I always say, you know, when you can get someone to think it was their idea, they're going to do it without much enforcement. So I, I do believe in local control, but when you, I don't think we have restored trust in government enough to turn all of the healthcare system over right now. Now, I, I, I actually am a, I, I think it would make sense if we had started in 1945 the way Britain did uh, or some of the other countries did, um, we might have that kind of a system that built on a minimum level of care and adding level of care, but we didn't. We started with a what you can afford you get system in this country uh, and it, that market has led to the kind of irrational system that we have. Rationalizing it with a single payer, I think, would be a wonderful ideal. But I don't see getting over these hurdles, at least in my tenure. I've only got about 14 months left. So um, that's my thought about where we are on this. The University of Washington just uh, started a big initiative in population health. And do you have any advice for us about how we integrate with uh, the insurance markets and the medical providers and getting them to understand the importance of uh, addressing population health issues. How long do you have? Uh, <laughs> well, we minutes. spent a long time. In, 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 let me just, uh, so I came back to, uh, after being in state and federal government and, and in the private sector, I, uh, and with a brief stint in academia in between there, uh, I came back to uh, the academic sector a few years ago to launch this Institute for Population Health Improvement and under the uh, belief that uh, state government and the university should be working much more closely together and that there really are, are potential synergies there. Uh, and we've been relatively successful. I think we've done over 40 different uh, programs uh, with an aggregate value of over $120 million over the last few years. Uh, but it hasn't been easy, uh, and there's been uh, significant barriers to uh, overcome both uh, within the, the government, and, and we've done a variety of programs from working with the, the Veterans uh, Homelessness uh, Prevention Program to implementing HIEs uh, in the state and working with Medi-Cal and uh, a variety of other things. So we, we've covered the waterfront, uh, and there are some 
significant issues uh, with the state, which by and large, I, I think we've been over to over, overcome. Uh, Diana could perhaps uh, give her view on that. But I think that the biggest barrier comes from the academic uh, community uh, and getting uh, both academics to think differently uh, about the work that they do uh, and that maybe it's not all about the, uh, the paper uh, that you're going to get out of it, but actually doing uh, some community good or public service. Uh, and also how they uh, consider activities for promotion and tenure and you know, all those sorts of things, which are uh, to many people pretty esoteric uh, academic issues. But they really are uh, important. And, and I found actually it's been harder uh, to bring the academic sector around than it has been uh, working with uh, the government. Uh, I'd be happy to have a more uh, expansive conversation with you offline. So I think the problem starts uh, even earlier. So I recently, I went to my daughter's elementary school graduation and they had about 100 kids there and they had to say, what are you gonna do when you grow up? So you know, going with the first panel, 90 kids said, I'm gonna help save the environment. There was no kid which said, I'm going to control healthcare costs or <laughs> I'm going to fix population health. So we need to start working. Even my daughter didn't say that. So we need to really start working on that. That's a great way to end. So I want, uh, let's give a round of applause to this terrific panel and thank you for your question.